Hello, I'm Guy Lamolinar of the Library of Congress and head of its Center for the Book. The Center is a network of 53 Library of Congress affiliates in the 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Together with these affiliates, the Center at the Library of Congress carries out its mission of promoting books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. Today, we are kicking off the first of the library's programs teaching our affiliate centers for the book with a focus on New York's Empire State Center for the Book. The center, which has been a library affiliate since 2002, is headquartered at the New York Library Association. Among the many programs of the center is its New York State Writers Hall of Fame, which celebrates some of the states and the country's most important writers. This includes such esteemed writers as Jacqueline Woodson, who was a Library of Congress National Ambassador for Young People's Literature in 2018 and 19. Today, we will hear from the renowned writer and New York native and resident Colson Whitehead, two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize and 2020 recipient of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. Colson was also a 2018 inductee into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame which includes writers not just from the present, but also from the past. The library's fiction prize is meant to honor an American literary writer whose body of work is distinguished not only for its mastery of the art, but also for its originality of thought and imagination. The award seeks to commend strong, unique, enduring voices that throughout long, consistently established careers have told us something important about the American experience. Colson Whitehead is the 12th recipient of the award, and he certainly meets that description. His last two novels, The Nickel Boys and The Underground Railroad, are consecutive winners of the Pulitzer Prize, historical novels that showcase Colson's unique ability to draw from history to speak to the issues of today. His forthcoming novel is The Harlem Shuffle, it has been described as a gloriously entertaining novel of heist shakedowns and ripoffs set in Harlem of the 1960s. Colson will be in conversation today with his fellow New Yorker Rocco Steno, who is the director of the Empire State Center for the Book. Rocco has been a longtime innovative leader of the center, tirelessly promoting the rich literary riches of New York State. I want to thank Rocco for all you have done in your work for the Empire State Center. And I also, of course, want to thank Colson. Thank you for sharing your time with us and for being such an extraordinary ambassador for the Library of Congress as our prize for American fiction recipient. Please welcome Colson Whitehead and Rocco Steno. Thank you, Guy. It's a pleasure to be here with Colson Whitehead a member of the New York State Writers Hall of Fame, uh, and, and among other things. I know that's the award you tell everybody right off. Yes, no, but, uh, <laughs> but well-deserved. And uh, the title of uh, today's conversation is Colson Whitehead's uh, New York and, uh, and how New York uh, uh, affects uh, what you write and how you write it. You know, and, you know, your most recent book, Nickel Boys is based in Florida, but New York makes an appearance uh, in the book, uh, New York of the uh, 1960s. Why New York and not another city? You know, I always feel better when I can get New York into a book with uh, the Underground Railroad, for example. It's about um, a slave in the South running north. And there's a slave catcher named Ridgeway who um, is pursuing her. And I was, I was having trouble finding her character find the slave catcher's character. And then I read um, Eric Foner's book about the Underground Railroad, which deals about the sort of war between abolitionists and slave catchers in New York in the 19th century. And something clicked. You know, the slave catcher, Ridgeway, comes to New York like so many people and becomes himself. He discovers himself once he comes to the big city. And once I made that connection, uh, I found out who he was. And, you know, it was a great relief to get, you know, three pages of New York into this book about the South. And it was sort of the same thing with uh, the Nickel Boys. One of the, um, of the characters, he's in his reform school in Florida, 
and as he gets older, he comes to the north to find himself and ends up in New York City. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to spend the whole book dealing with this reform school and the, and the terrible abuses. It's really about the two main characters, these two boys, and what happens to them after the school. How do they find themselves or not find themselves? And so in the case of Elwood, uh, the grown-up Elwood, he comes to New York, uh, Manhattan, in the West Village, it's on the West Side in the 80s, and finds himself. And weirdly, you know, when the book came out, I started meeting survivors of the real-life model for the school. And the first person I talked to, you know, he turned out he lived a few blocks away from me uh, on the Upper West Side. So we met. And so he was a dozier in the 60s and then moved to um, 84th and Broadway when he moved to New York. And I, in the book, in the, Nickel, uh, the Nickel Boys, the main character comes to uh, Broadway in 83rd. So it was weird um, that it worked out that way. Uh, but, you know, sort of following uh, that that very old story of black Southerners coming to New York. Yes. Now, um, so uh, in the book, it's uh, the uh, New York of the 1960s. And um, myself being of a certain age, I actually, as a kid, remember <laughs> the garbage strike, and uh, which uh, you discuss in there. So but what type of uh, research uh, did you do to uh, create that uh, New York? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it's fair. You know, my, my book that's coming out in the fall is about Harlem in the Harlem in the '60s, and I, I did a lot of location scouting, trying to figure out where my main character works and lives, and where his office is, and where various things happen. In the case, I didn't. Do, in the case of Nickel Boys, I didn't do a lot of location scouting, but I was trying to find you know different moments in New York history after '65 that would suit the book. And so, um, we meet Elwood as, as a grown-up. He's uh, it's a uh, the, the week of the garbage strike in the mid 70s. And um, uh, he's watching the, uh, this movie, The Defiant Ones, on television. And so, in that case, uh, where you know, two prisoners are trying to escape a chain gang. And uh, in that case, I, I went to the New York Times archive and wanted to see what was playing on uh, the movie of the week on, on July 3rd. Uh, of this year and turned out to be the defiant ones and it served the book. And so um, later in the 80s, there's a brief 80s chapter where he watches the marathon. And the marathon is this great communal event in New York City. You know, I've lived in Manhattan, lived in Brooklyn, and uh, always, you know, that first week in November when the when the runners are coming up Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn or Lafayette in Brooklyn or 59th Street, you know, the whole city comes together in this uh, communal adoration of the, of the runners. And so, so, so that, that's the moment where the main character enters into his New York hood. He sort of sees him as part of this great community of, uh, of white, black, rich, poor, all coming together to celebrate uh, the marathon. Um, and uh, and late, later on when he's married, you know, uh, there's a, a different sort of New York. But, you know, I was trying to find different stops along his um, adult life in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, that would serve a story. And sometimes, in this case, it meant, you know, maybe looking up the history of the marathon, who won this year or that year. Um, uh, it's not as fun as sort of location scouting as I've been doing lately. Yeah, you mentioned your uh, next book is set in New York and uh, Holm Shuffle. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, in general, I write a, a more serious book and a, a book that has more jokes. And with Underground Railroad and Nickel Boys, you know, it's two sort of serious books, you know, back to back. Um, so, you know, a crime novel, you know, paradoxically is a little bit lighter. There's more uh, room for jokes. And so it follows a, uh, a, a criminal offense. You know, if you watch heist movies, they always like steal the diamonds and then they go to a fence and the fence is like, I'll give you 10 cents and a dollar. And so it's like a, a huge outrage, like do all the work. And then this fence, you know, takes all, all their profits. And so I was thinking, I love heist movies, but I always hate the guy they take it to. So why not write a book about him? And so it's about a small time fence in Harlem in the 60s and then follows his, uh, his route to um, uh, a more grander criminality. You know, he finds uh, the crook within over the course of a couple of years.
And uh, when is that uh, book uh, being released? It's soon. It's right? coming out in September uh, 2021. And, um, and you know, and as I was saying, you know, I was doing a lot of location scouting and also trying to figure out what businesses were on 125th Street in the 60s, trying to find locations. And the, uh, the Hotel Teresa was a, a big hotel in the 50s and 40s. Um, it was called the Waldorf of Harlem. And, you know, the, the big fires would stay there. JFK did a campaign stop there. Um, Castro came in the 60s. And so I was doing all this research about the Hotel Teresa and the chalk full of nuts that was there. And the main character has some meetings in the chalk full of nuts. And then I, you know, saw my mother and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm writing about the 60s and Hotel Teresa. And she's like, oh, yeah, I hung out, that, hung out at that, you know, chalk full of nuts all the time. You know, she and my dad were young, uh, a young couple in New York at that time. And a month later, I was writing about Blumstein's. It was like a, uh, a department store on 125th Street. And I was telling my mother, oh, yeah, Blumstein's. And she's like, oh, yeah, your dad worked there for like two summers. It was like a summer <laughs> job, like a stock boy. And so I was doing all this research on the Internet when I should have been talking to my mother. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. Did she uh, talk about the uh, cream cheese sandwiches at Chalk Full of Nuts? <laughs> uh, I think she's more of a hot dog person, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so. You're a New Yorker, right? Uh, born and bred, as they say, uh, in yeah. New York City. And so can you take us on a tour of uh, Colson Whitehead's New York? You know, you know, places that stand out from uh, your childhood to right now. Well, I mean, you know, we, we lived all over town. I had like, three siblings and, you know, one goes to college. We moved to a different uh, neighborhood. I was smaller or... My parents' business is doing better, moved to a bigger apartment. And so by the time uh, I got to college, I lived in uh, 139th and Riverside, 97th and 5th, um, 57th Street. And for high school and college, 101st and West End. And, um, uh, and you know, high school is your big sort of identity formation you know, period. And so that's really my, um, my favorite New York, uh, the Upper West Side in the 80s. I, I was in Brooklyn for 18 years um, uh, when, I, when I worked at the Village Voice. All the sort of young writers are moving to Brooklyn, Fort Greene. There was that romance of uh, Spike Lee's Black Brooklyn. And so we we're all moving out there. And um, it was great being there before it got you know, really gentrified. It was great uh, raising kids there um, in the early part of this century. Um, but now I'm back on, you know, on the Upper West Side again. My wife's parents live nearby, and, you know, it's good to be we're sort of older, and it's good to be close by. And um, I love how much is the same, and I, I marvel about how much is different. You know, I, I love the light off of Broadway in uh, the mid-afternoon, bouncing off the buildings in the, in the 70s. Uh, I love Amsterdam in the 90s. You know, I used to walk down there to school you know, for years. And um, there's still that, you know, there's still some bodega culture, there's new condos, it's, you know, a mix of, you know, my 80s New York and, and what it is now. And it's nice to sort of be able to sort of toggle between these, you know, these two different periods. Um, so yeah, so I'm back in Manhattan, you know, I used to joke that I moved to Brooklyn um, to get away from all the people who annoy me. And then I woke up one day and all of them had moved to Brooklyn, so it was easy. It was time to come back to Manhattan. <laughs> it was safe, safe again. So. <laughs> Terrific. You know, I'm actually speaking to you from uh, 57th Street, so it's, yeah, so part of the neighborhood. Yes, uh, the um, but it's not only New York City, right? You uh, spent time uh, on Long Island. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my parents uh, had a place in Sag Harbor, Long Island. My grandfather had built it in the 40s. Um, so I, so my first summer I, I spent there. I spent most of my summers there growing up um, in Sag Harbor. There's a black neighborhood within this, you know, sort of uh, wider uh, part of the Hamptons. And uh, it goes back, you know, goes back 150 years. There were Native American and black sailors who were part of like the whaling community. And they lived, you know, a mile outside outside of Main Street. And in the um, the early part of the 20th century, 
there were black teachers and bankers and, and preachers and and uh, that sort of thing who started going out there and they would tell their friends and their friends would buy a plot of land and eventually became this you know uh, black community in Sag Harbor in the 40s and 50s and then you know still there. Yes, and uh, speaking of Sag Harbor, that uh, sounds familiar. That's a title of one of your books. And yes, um, <laughs> yes, you know, I mean, uh, most of my books have some sort of New York link. Um, and in the case of, of Sag Harbor, uh, I thought it was time to be a little more personal. I was sort of, I'd been sort of removed um, in uh, the, my first few novels, and I thought it'd be a good, uh, um, good for my personal growth and artistic growth to do something a little more autobiographical where I had a little more skin in the game. And so the book is about growing up in the 80s. Uh, the main character is a New Yorker who goes to Sag Harbor and uh, is in high school and has like his community of, of black friends he's grown up with and covers one one summer. And it's not a summer where like, you know, stand by me where like they find a dead body in the woods and like all this crazy stuff happens. It's really just um, that kind of slow identity formation that happens when you're in high school. Who am I? You know, uh, where do I fit in with my family, my community? Um, where do I stand apart from them? So as opposed to say, you know, my last couple of books, which, you know, do have a lot of high stakes, you know, the big action packed scene in Sag Harbor is when he gets his uh, braces off <laughs> around chapter seven. So it's really just about uh, sort of a character piece, a character sketch about a, a time. And it really is a time capsule because the Sag Harbor that's described doesn't really, you know, um, exist anymore. You know, the Hamptons is sort of squalored up. In the 80s, it was still kind of quaint and corny. And uh, as a former whaling town, you know, they make bumper stickers that said, you know, I had a whale of a great time in Sag Harbor. And that kind of, you know, kitschy stuff is gone. And it's, you know, expensive sandwiches and stuff like that. Uh, and so, you know, um, you know, I feel really great when people say, I like the book, I love the book. And it also captures, you know, Long Island at that time, uh, a time period that's gone. Right. Uh, I guess in the back in the acknowledgments, you acknowledge an ice cream store out there. Uh, and uh, so I worked a few summers at Big Olaf and it's still there. You know, uh, uh, my old boss still runs it. He had like a mini ice cream empire at the end of Long Island. Um, and so uh, I remember I, I wrote a small piece about it for the New York Times about sort of like a teaser of the book about why I can't eat ice cream anymore because I would eat ice cream all day and get sick and the next day do it again. And so now I have like ice cream once a year. But they were fact checking the piece and they called up my boss and um, then they called me and it's like, he denies that he paid you minimum wage. <laughs> and um, I was like, well, you know, let's let it go. We can change that line. It's, it is true. And those <laughs> five cent raises were uh coveted and fought over between me and my friends and you know if you got the five cents raise and not the, the 10 cent raise you know you were um had to you know kiss, kiss some butt the next week to move up the ladder so um but yes uh if you're in long island now you go to big olaf and you can see the uh, see the joint right exactly a shout out and uh, you know it may have been minimum wage but you also got all the ice cream you could eat Yes. Um, and again, and now actually uh, writing the book helped me through some personal problems. And now I couldn't eat ice cream for many years because of the memories. But now I have ice cream a couple times a year. So, you know, novels as catharsis, healing, you know, it's all true. Right. You know, um, one of the uh, members of the uh, the Hall of Fame here in New York is uh, uh, E.B. White. And uh, he wrote a book called uh, Here is uh, New York. And so you wrote uh, a book similar to this, uh, in the sense that a classes of New York uh, is 13, I think it's a 13? Uh, 13, if I remember correctly, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've written two novels. And then um, as a side project, I was writing these sort of impressionistic pieces about the city, about Central Park, about Rush Hour. Um, and they weren't, you know, a book really. They were sort of, for me, I really like the voice, you know, it's um, 
the boys sort of moves in and out of different perspectives. It's I, you, he, she. It zooms up for a very impersonal view of the city and then zooms in on a very uh, close detail. And then 9-11 uh, happened, and I had to you know, put down the novel I, I was working on to sort of figure out how I could live in my, my home city, which is, had suffered this great wound. And um, so I went on Colossus full time and wrote 13 pieces. Um, and it's about New York City, but it's also about like any place you know and love. It could be, you know, Sao Paulo, it could be Paris. Um, it's any place where, you know, you, you do mark the seasons of your life by that store disappearing, that theater opening and closing. What'd you see there? Now it's a condo. Um, this is where you kissed so-and-so, um, and it's still there. Uh, so all that, that sort of mental map of the self that we superimpose upon the city. Um, and it, it was, you know, I, I felt better writing it. Like it's not a Valentine to New York. It's uh, you no know, New York warts and all. And, um, and again, it was, a, it was a, like looking back, I can't believe like I wrote 13 short pieces about New York and then they were published. So, so but uh, I guess like, but it happened and it was a weird impulse. I think back then I was, you know, a little more freer in terms of, of uh, what I wanted to do. And so, you know, this, in terms of my personality, it looks like a weird choice and it's, it's a lovely book, but I was looking back, I was pretty young and thought I could do anything apparently. <laughs> well, I have to say, I just picked it up and I, uh, growing up in my teenage years, I worked in Coney Island and I uh, enjoyed that piece because you kind of captured, uh, the feel of uh, uh, Coney Island, you know, as you said, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I, enjoy but I think, yeah, I think it's Coney Island, but also any, uh, there's so many places that have the kind of beach or ocean uh, promenade, and maybe it's Virginia or Florida or California, but uh, the boardwalk, you know, looms so large in so many different places. So even if you've never been to Coney Island, hopefully you can see your own boardwalk. Many members of the Hall of Fame, you know, the year uh, you were inducted, I believe, uh, Jackie Woodson, who uh, was the national ambassador for young people's literature, was also inducted, and uh, Russell Shorto, those were the uh, the living uh, individuals. And uh, But as uh, Guy mentioned, you know, it's both uh, uh, current uh, writers like yourself, but um, people that have uh, made a, a lasting impact. And I was just wondering, uh, what New York writers had an, imp uh, an impact on you? Well, um, you know, I guess when you were talking about that, I was thinking of how when I lived in Fort Greene, I lived two blocks down from where uh, uh, Richard Wright was writing in the 30s or 40s. So, you know, there's so many, you know, there's so many, I feel like I've been blessed to live in a lot of different places where people have idolized, have, um, uh, have walked or slept you know, I think a lot of us have probably walked through Katz's over the last couple of decades and, and gotten a hot dog or a knish or something. Um, but, you know, and walking around uh, uh, uptown, you know, I passed uh, where George Carlin, you know, grew up and he's a, he was a Harlemite. And I think you should induct him. You know, he's a few books, um, you know, watching his specials on HBO with my family when I was like 10 or 11. Uh, uh, his specials of Richard Pryor, um, uh, you know, they would, they definitely inform my point of view. They would veer from the, the comedic to the tragic from, you know, bit to bit. And, um, and I think I, I see a lot of New Yorkness in, uh, in George Carlin. And, uh, and when he talks about growing up, going to Catholic school and playing hooky in Harlem, you know, I feel like those streets are, are still here with us now. You know, usually they'll say, so what are you reading? But I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask you what's on your playlist when you're writing. Yeah, well, well I mean, um, I, you know, I uh, uh, play music when I when I work. You know, I always have since I was in high school. You know, growing up in the city, there's all sorts of noises. There's like a car going by, a, a, siren, a, a fire engine, a car alarm. Uh, neighbors being choked to death upstairs and her screams echoing through the night. So it's a noisy city. And I've always just played loud music uh, to drown out what's happening outside. And so 
I have a 3,000 song playlist, and it goes from um, stuff I was playing 40 years ago, uh, David Bowie and Prince, uh, to Daft Punk, Edith Piaf, Ornette Coleman, uh, Run DMC. It's just a mix of you know 3,000 songs I like and love. And it keeps me company. And uh, I'll sing along, have a little dance party. Um, it helps the day go by. So um, yeah, I recommend it. Although a lot of people don't like to hear music when they work. Thanks for joining us today, Colson, and sharing your New York with us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks all you New Yorkers for, for tuning in. Um, it's been a hard year, but I think we're uh, approaching the end of something. I you know, Things are looking up. So I hope to see you on the other side. Take care. I'd like to thank the Library of Congress for giving the Empire State Center for the Book the opportunity to chat with Colson Whitehead, one of our Hall of Fame members. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Rocco, thank you so much for that great interview. And Colson, thank you for that marvelous conversation. We will continue to look forward to hearing your unique voice and reading your amazing work. And I also want to thank our audience. And you can learn more about the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction at loc.gov, where you can also explore our extraordinary collections featuring millions of items, many of them unique and rare. I hope you will also join us for our companion program, Pop Life, Literature and, Cult Literature and Culture, featuring Colson Whitehead in conversation with the new director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Kevin Young. The conversation led by author Isaac Fitzgerald will be broadcast just a few days from now on Thursday, April 1st at 7 p.m. You can find more about this and other literary programs at the Library of Congress by going to loc.gov engage.